the first problem that in order to do that, you have to assume S is a function of P and P, right? Is that correct? Yes. It's like saying Sha is a function of elevation and temperature. You are, but it's a bad representation of Sha. You are clearly a function of so much more, right? So natural, so this is just this is a good way to recap things, you know. So when you write E as a function of P, V, S, that's a thermodynamically complete representation. You can work with it. You can, sorry, actually, no, right? There is a problem there. This is, it's been a while since we did thermo. Huh? <laughs> if, let's, let's just start with the simplest. If you start S as a function of N, V, E, that's thermodynamically complete. This does not mean that, so this is thermo D complete. That does not mean that you cannot write S as a function of NVT. You can still write it. Such a function will exist. It will be a complicated partial differential equation, which will be thermodynamically incomplete. Now, in thermodynamics, the irony is that to solve certain problems, you have to figure out which representation to use. Sometimes you have to work with incomplete representations or you won't be able to solve the problem. So that's why you're like, wait, why do I have to assume this? So because that's a partial differential equation, I have a multiple constant that they're not counting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that constant plays a role when I count. But in the thing that you're trying to prove, it doesn't matter. Turns out. So given a problem, given a relation that you have to prove, which representation should you start with? That's not obvious. That takes intuition. And that's why you have to work through a lot of problems to get that intuition. OK? So you cannot, you don't have to always start with S of NVE, that is thermodynamically complete. That knows everything. But for certain problems, you are best off starting from another representation. For example, the first problem. OK? So this is only true for this specific case? Of for this specific problem. Other problems will require other representations. Okay. Yeah, but that representation ideally might not be actually give us the correct difference, let's say. It will always give a correct difference. It might be true up to a constant. But what's the amazing thing about differences? Constants go away, right? That's the other reason why it does not matter. When you're talking about the difference between two things, often constants go away. If I asked you to calculate correct CP as a function of temperature, that's another story. Then you might need a thermodynamic complete. So that, that's where it comes from. So, so what you're discovering is the mystery of thermodynamics. Ask Chuck today. There will be a pop quiz after that. <laughs> it's happening, see? Okay, let's let's do a brief recap. So last, any other questions? So last time, the key lesson that we saw last time, which is really a summary of what we have done so far, is the conditions for spontaneity. It can be written in many ways, which are equivalent. One is that ds total which is the ds of the system plus ds of the surrounding more than zero, right? But this is really hard because you have to go and calculate the change in entropy of the surrounding also, right? That's a complicated thing to do. So if you don't want to worry about entropy change of surrounding, you can do it as ds system more than delta q system by temperature. Which homework problem did these two relations play a role in, if you have already done that? Don't tell me you haven't started yet. Then you are really brilliant. It's problem six, right? When you look at the spontaneous freezing or melting of ice, this is exactly what you do over here, right? But as you saw, it was complicated, right? You have to look up a bunch of things on the internet. Where does it come from? Which number, that number, right? So it would be nice if you could write down spontaneity only in conditions, only in functions that depend on the system. That cannot be done in a general case, but for two special cases, it can be done. One is constant temperature volume process. In this case, spontaneous change is given by dA system less than zero. You don't have to worry about surrounding at all. You don't have to worry about Q at all. So it's just purely state function, which is amazing. The process itself could be happening through some complicated pathway. Right? does not matter. All that matters is the endpoints. That's it. If you have a chemical reaction that is going from A to B to C, or you have a chemical reaction that is going from A to D to X to Y to C, you can ignore X to Y to C. 
all the things in the middle. All that matters is A and C, the endpoints, right? That's because it's a state function. And constant T and P process T G system less than zero, where we define for the first time A, which is the Helmholtz free energy defined as E minus TS and G is the Gibbs free energy. Some books don't call both of them as free energy. They call only Gibbs free energy and Helmholtz energy. I don't care. I think both are free energy. H minus TS. So, so we know that the natural variables for S are NVE, right? And then the postulate said that the partial S by partial E is monotonic positive. It's, it's a positive quantity. That allowed us to write down E as a function of S and V. So the natural variables for E were N, V, S. So the question is, question is, what are the natural variables? What are A's natural variables? What are G's natural variables? And before this, we snuck in one more state function. Anyone remembers what it was? In the context of heat capacity, enthalpy. What was enthalpy? Enthalpy was U plus PV, right? What are enthalpy's natural variables? So what do you think should be the natural variable for A and why? Why should it be that? Chocolate is at stake now, Toblerones. So what should be natural variables for A? Lydia, what do you think? E, well, you get a chocolate anyway. N is going to be for all, okay? But apart from N, why did you think E and T? Because you're looking at E minus T, yes. No, it's a bit complicated. Any other guess? Why? Because A is describing a constant temperature volume process, right? So that's, so think about, why did we have for a constant number, and this is a subtle point, so listen to me carefully, for a constant number volume energy process, what was the direction of spontaneity? Entropy going up, right? Entropy was the only thing that told you about this condition of spontaneity. For a constant number volume and temperature process, what tells us the direction of spontaneity? A. Right, So you can see there is a parallel here that just like S told us something about constant number volume energy, A is telling us something about constant number volume temperature. On this, So A is natural and we will prove this in two different ways. We will do it through algebra and then we will get to Lagrangian transforms and show why they are actually, why is there a deeper connection. So A's natural variables become N volume and temperature. How about G's natural variables? Go ahead. He really wants to chuck. <laughs> so N, P, and T. Okay, double chocolate question. What are the natural variables for enthalpy? This is the moment where Professor Leah Dodson's student, who is working with Leah, going to work with Leah. What's his name? Nathan. Nathan. Nathan McLean. He would sit here and he remembered this in this class and he never forget. So do you know what are H's natural variables? It's super non-trivial. I'll give you a chocolate anyway. <laughs> Sorry. A's natural variables turn out to be S, P, and N. That's highly non-trivial, right? You cannot just look at it and say like, this should be that. So, so we'll work through all this. But before that, we do a pop quiz. Why oh, what? Oh, I don't know why, we will prove it. I cannot tell you why yet. Okay, pop quiz. So it's just filling the blanks. Wherever there is a question mark, you should try. It's good. And they have a better of Yeah, and it's participation only. Try to do your best job. 
the whole idea is to show you what is it that is not clear to you. It's cold around here. Did anyone not get up? Okay. So we have a chemical reaction, A plus B going to C. Delta Q heat is being given to the system at constant temperature and process, uh, pressure. There are four questions. The first two are for constant temperature pressure. The last two are the same thing, but constant temperature volume. And Rohan, you are on Zoom, so you should send me a message on Slack. Okay, one minute to go. Is it the last two or constant temperature and volume? These two are constant temperature and pressure, these two are constant. Okay, let's wrap it up. Who else? It's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Let's go back. Let's go back. First one. Who is confident in their answer? Sorry. Thank you, Baiti. Right? That's exactly what we wrote over here, right? DS system. In this case, DS system is SA plus. SB minus SC. Now you could be like, why did you say SA plus SB minus SC? Should it be SC minus SA minus SB? Is this correct or did, did we flip the sign? We flipped it, right? So the correct answer actually is minus delta Q over T if you're going to be very careful, okay? Second one, who is confident? Okay, and you could say the second one, you could squeeze in the SA plus SB minus SC and make a mockery of my question. But the point here was to think about G, right? So in terms of G, uh, Zhao Cheng, what do you think? So G C should be smaller than G A plus G B. Right, the free energy should go, the Gibbs free energy should go down because it's a constant temperature pressure. So, GA plus GB should be 
smaller than GC. Very good catch. Third one. Should the third one be any different from number one? Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, shouldn't uh, should it be GC? GC? Yeah. Yeah. The free energy. I can't give him a chocolate. <laughs> This is his loss. Okay, Rohan, now you tell me, why should the third one be the same as, the answer to the third one, why should it be the same as the first one? Why should it be, why the, should same? It be the same? It is the same, why? Uh, because it, uh, because this holds this for, holds for any process, process, right? process right? This right? For any process, right? When we said that DS system is more than delta Q system by temperature, we are not saying whether it's constant temperature, volume, constant temperature, any process, right? So this is going to be, Identical to number one. Fourth one, not Rohan, Stephen. It will look like three, but we have to change one thing. Yeah, there you go, you got a chocolate. See, so thermo is easy. If I just wrote down the answers for this one, you would all be like, uh, 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 obvious. But right now, if I was to sample this, I think 80% of you got it wrong. That's how thermo is. So midway through the semester, someone comes up to me like, oh, it's so boring, I know everything. But that does not reflect in the pop quizzes because it's subtle, right? It's easy to make mistakes. So it's really, really simple concepts, but it's subtle. So in this case, it will be, well, bad notation, AA plus AB more than AC, okay? So good, I will keep giving pop quizzes. I think it's a good way to wake up, you know, and just make sure that you know where you are. And I think it will improve your midterm scores and stuff like that to have a really clear idea of what is it that you understand and don't understand. What we have to do now is to actually, what we are going to do now is two things. We are going to look at natural variables more carefully for G. We, the only two natural variables that we know about with confidence are S of NVE, because that is the postulate, and E of NVS that follows from the monotonicity. But we said that natural variables for G are NPT. Let's try to look at that carefully. So what we are going to do next is natural variables and something called Maxwell's relations, which are notoriously hard to remember. I do not expect you to remember them. I can never remember them. There are lots of cheat codes on the internet where you draw magic squares and draw lines. It becomes painful just to remember the cheat code. So don't do that. You know, In, in your final exam, which will be in class, you can have a cheat sheet, and one of the things you should definitely put on the cheat sheet is four Maxwell relations. There is no point in remembering them. You should, however, know how to derive them. And if you understand fundamental relations and natural variables, it's very easy to derive them, okay? So in order to do this, let's first start with the simplest one. Let's revisit energy, okay? Natural variables for energy. What was the fundamental relation for energy? Who have I not given chocolate? I want all of you to get chocolate. Marie, next fundamental relation for energy. DE is equal to delta Q plus delta W. That's correct, but those are path functions, right? So I can write it down in terms of state functions. Do you remember that one, the integrated first and second law? I'll give you a hint. TDS minus PDV plus mu DN, correct? Here's your chocolate. So this relation, which we call the integrated first and second law of thermodynamics included all the information, right? This was, so natural variables are connected to fundamental relation. A fundamental relation means that you have taken a state function and written it down in terms of a differential of three functions so that it is thermodynamically complete. Now you could have written down the fundamental relation as DE is equal to something multiplied by DT plus something else, plus something else, right? Then you would have the situation that Shah brought up in the beginning of the class. It would still be true, but it won't be a fundamental relation because it is missing some information, right? It will be, it will be a PDE, it will be a partial differential equation. So this is a fundamental relation that you should not forget 
this is the type of stuff you should not have to write on your cheat sheet. This would be ingrained in your head. And this shows that E is equal to E of SVN is our is an is a fundamental relation, right? So how did we get to TDS minus PDV plus mu dn? We took E is equal to E of SVN. Remember back in the first, second or third lecture, we wrote down partial derivatives. And then you did in your first homework, the proof that the thermodynamic temperature is the same as the physical temperature and things like that, right? That's where we got it. So we have, so we can see that E has uh, natural variables, SVN. We can go one step further from this and we will do natural variables for the other state functions just in a moment. I want to look in order to derive Maxwell relations, one always looks at constant n. Now that's the way they are derived, okay? So if you're looking at constant n, equation one becomes dE is equal to TDS minus PDV. So <clears throat> this is a nice total derivative, okay? dE, there is no path function here. This is nice total derivative. Such total derivatives have a very special property that is known as Euler's relation. And if you don't remember Euler's relation, the best way to brush up your memory is to go to Khan's Academy. Look up Khan's Academy on Euler's relation. He does a very, very good job of going through it. It's, it's the quickest way to brush it up. And unless and until it is like slam dunk obvious to you what it is, in the sense that if I really called you on the blackboard here and you were able to write it down without looking up the internet, that means you should look up Hans Academy. And if it is that obvious to you, you're welcome to come here. Does anyone think it's that? I will give you five chocolates. I wouldn't come. I wouldn't take this part. It's easy to mess up. Okay, so look, look it, look that up. I will, I will re rehash it here for you. Let's think of some function of two variables. Okay, x and y. So Matt, give me a simple function that depends on x and y. Some simple function. x squared plus y squared. Okay, that's very good. He did not screw up my life. He could have been like, oh, simple function, x plus hyperbolic tan of y <laughs> minus x. No, that would be terrible. So let's look at this function and let's write down df for this function. What would df be? df would be d of x squared plus d of y squared, right? What is that? That is df is equal to 2dx plus 2dy, right? So if Matt had given me some general complicated function, let's say I could have written df in the following form, something multiplied by dx plus something multiplied by dy, okay? So in Matt's function, the thing that is multiplied by x by multiplied by dx is just a number two. Right, it's, it's the simplest thing you can could have had, but in general, it will be some function of x and y, right? H of x comma y, and let's say the second one in general is some other function of x and y, g of x comma y. Euler's relation says that for all functions that can be written in this way, you must have partial h by partial y at constant x is equal to partial g by partial x at constant y. So you take this function, differentiate it with its respect to y at constant x, or you take this function and differentiate it with respect to x at constant y. Both of them will give you the same derivative. In other words, what it is telling you is that double derivative of f with respect to x first and y next is the same as the double derivative of f with respect to y first and x next, okay? That's Euler's relation. Does this hold true for Matt's function? What if h for Matt's function is two? What is partial two by partial y? Zero. In which one? df is h dx plus y g dy then or this this one two dx is correct it can't be two x it will always be change 
b of x square by oh, oh i see what you're saying you're saying d of x square by d of x is equal to 2x so you should have a 2x yes i missed that sorry about that well math function is a bit more complicated then okay then but let's still do that you're correct so let's look at h now h is equal to 2x thankfully the partial h by partial y still stays the same what is partial of 2x with respect to partial y zero what is partial of 2y with respect to partial x zero so max function satisfies this right we can go to some other function i want someone to give me a slightly more complicated function show mercy on me okay murray give me another function of x and y be nice <laughs> How about this? Okay. So let's do df. That is 3x squared dx, right? Plus x dy plus y dx. Did I get it right? Okay. So df is equal to 3x squared plus y multiplied by dx plus x dy. So in this case, this is our h and this is our g, right? So what does Euler say? Euler says partial of H with respect to the other thing, which is Y, right? So partial of H with partial Y at constant X, what is that going to be? One, it's constant X, right? So three X squared does not matter. So this is one while partial G by partial X at constant Y is also equal to one. So you can write down any function and this will be true. So that's Euler's relation. And Maxwell's relation is nothing but apply, applying Euler's relation to the fundamental equation. That's how you get Maxwell's relation. That's it. I will give a moment before, before we go further. Yeah. So Maxwell's relations are oh, now Euler came up with so many equations that if you just look up Euler's equation, you'll find like 50 equations, right? He, he was very prolific. So this part, some people also call it Euler's condition for existence of a total derivative. Euler's equation, or more technically, this is Euler's condition for existence of a total derivative. It is more useful from the other direction. If someone gave you H and a G, which did not follow this property that partial h by partial y is equal to partial g by partial x, then you won't be able to integrate and get a total derivative. But we won't be using it for that here. We are using just a simpler version. Applied, so Euler's equation applied to fundamental equations. So, so far we have seen one fundamental equation, which is dE is equal to TDS, minus PDV and the other thing applied to fundamental equation at constant N. That's what we do for Maxwell relation. The N does not matter. So DE is equal to TDS minus PDV. So what will Maxwell relation look for this one? What is the equivalent of H here? That is T, right? So first of all, what is X and Y here? That is S and V. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask a Yeah. So in Jasper, I remember that this example of theorem, Hmm? Claire Cotts theorem. theorem. Yeah, that this part of these partial derivatives are always the same. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. is there a difference in thermodynamics? No, no, it's the same thing. Okay. It's the same thing. People, yeah, people keep kept rediscovering all this thing, or they were competitors and stuff like that. You know? So, okay. So here, S is the equivalent of X, and V is the equivalent of Y, right? Those are the D you have. So you will take and H is the equivalent of T and this minus P is what we have for G, right? That is our mapping. 
So that's how you can look at it carefully. So here it will become partial T. That's what we do for H. What should we differentiate it with respect to? What is the equivalent of Y? That is V, right? So partial T by partial volume at constant S is equal to minus partial P by partial S at constant volume. This is our first, I will, I will come back. This is our first example of a Maxwell's relation. It looks very bizarre. When you first look at it, it's like, why should such a thing exist, right? It does not make sense. It's like someone just made it up, you know, why should, but it exists for anything. It's not just an ideal gas, for absolutely any material, this will, this will exist. I want to use the fundamental relation to point out one more thing, which you have seen before. What is the connection between partial E and partial S at constant V with temperature? This is how we define temperature, remember? What is it? Ben? Even simpler, it's just T. Right, the differential is written over there, right? So if you went to this example, if you went to D, if you went to DF is equal to H DX plus G DY, then all I'm saying is that partial F by partial X at constant Y will be H, right? So we have already seen this, that partial E by partial F at constant V comma N is T. And if you really wanted to be careful here, you would write, V comma N and everything, but you know, that's if you were very, very careful because that's what we're doing. So Maxwell relations really apply for constant N, but since all of them have constant N, we sometimes don't write it, but that's implied. And third one, and, and the third relation we can write here is partial E by partial V at constant S is equal to minus P, right? So we have seen equation three and equation four before. They are not Maxwell relations. They are just the definition of thermodynamic temperature and pressure, but we have seen them before. We will write down similar equations for the other state functions. And they are very useful and we have not seen them before. So this one is our Maxwell relation number one. Now, there is no real numbering for Maxwell relations. No, if you go and Google Maxwell relation number one, you will get whatever. You could get one of the other max relations. I just because I did it in class the first one today, this is why I call it max relation number one. Okay. Now let's go to the state function which might give sleepless nights to Sanjana, which is enthalpy. Okay. So Sanjana, what was the definition of enthalpy? How did we define it? E plus PD. Right, that, that you need to remember. So the first thing we need to do is to write down a fundamental relation for H. How should we do that? Just like we had DE is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu DN. How do we write such a relation for H? Any ideas? Just write dh, let's get started from there, right? Because we know the fundamental relation applied for E, we knew dE. So let's start with dh and let's see what happens, right? So if we do dh, that will be dE plus PDV plus VDP. What is dE? That is our first fundamental relation, the integrated first and second law. PDS minus PDV plus mu dN. And then we have plus PDV plus VDP. Suddenly note, that minus PDV and plus PDV cancel out and you're left with DH is equal to TDS plus VDP plus mu DN. So what are the natural variables for H? They are S, P, and N. And this is exactly the same information as the integrated first and second law of thermodynamics, right? Because if you wanted, if you knew this equation, if you knew DH is equal to TDS plus VDP plus mu DN, and you did not know that DE is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu DN. You could have derived that, right? Just going the backward way. Instead of writing DH is equal to DE plus DPV, you could have written down DE is equal to DH minus DPV and derived. So, so moving from, so this is 
of fundamental relation. It has exactly the same information as the integrated first and second law of thermodynamics. And it shows us that the control variables for H are SPN, which are extremely bizarre, but that's how it is. Any questions about this? Okay, let's do the Maxwell relation. For Maxwell relation, for MR, this is Maxwell relation, we will do constant N, okay? We don't worry about N. So that gives us dH is equal to TDS plus VDP. Anyone wants to tell me what's the Maxwell relation here? Someone who has not had a chocolate? Maria Delia has not had a chocolate. <laughs> oh, I was so happy about chocolate. You can give it to your friends, but help me anyway. So I take this and differentiate it with respect to the other thing. So partial of T with respect to partial P at constant what? S is equal to partial V by at constant P. And you don't want to chocolate. No, I want it. Because that's how Maxwell relations are defined. I mean, that's that's how this this Maxwell relations are applicable to a constant n process. You could derive some similar relations for a process where n also varies. It just won't be that useful. So it's defined that way. Again, this equation, which we call equation number four, this is our second Maxwell relation. Maxwell relation number two looks very bizarre, can be super useful. Okay, and I will summarize all four in the end. Actually, let's call it equation number five because we also have a new fundamental equation. So we got a fundamental equation for H, which told us that natural variables for H are SPN. So if you had a process happening at a constant entropy, pressure and number, then the quantity that will tell you about spontaneity would be enthalpy. Would it increase, would it decrease? That's not obvious yet. We have to think about minimization versus extremization and maximization and things like that. We can do one more thing, just like we derived partial E by partial S at constant T uh, is, is equal to T, we can do something similar here. So what will be partial H by partial S at constant pressure? You want the chocolate? And uh, similarly, we can write down partial H by partial, what will this one be? P at constant S is equal to V, right? So today is like an explosion in partial derivatives. You are going to derive so many relations and that your head explodes. And a lot of thermodynamics problems end up to figuring out which of these relations to use. And there's no way on earth you can remember them. There's no point in trying to remember them, right? But the proof that you're working through should be obvious, the steps that we have done so far, right? There is nothing super profound about it. Any questions? Okay, let's go to G on the next page. So what is the definition of G? That is H minus TS, right? So how should I derive a fundamental relation for G? Again, the same thing, right? Let's write down DG. DG is equal to DH minus TDS minus SDT. But now we have dh, which is already a bit complicated. So dh itself is d of e plus pv minus tds minus sdt. Let's expand this. de plus pdv plus vdp minus tds minus sdt. Now we use our integrated first and second law. And de becomes tds minus pdv plus mu dn. And then this stuff, which is PDV plus VDP minus TDS minus SDT. It's a bunch of algebra, but a bunch of things cancel out. Minus PDV plus PDV cancels out. 
TDS minus TDS cancels out. We are left with only three terms. We are left with DG is equal to minus SDT plus VDP plus mu DN. So what are the natural variables of G? Just as we had suspected, the total derivative of G is given in terms of T, P, and N. Okay. For Maxwell relation number three, we will look at constant N. And I will slow down just a bit. And why are we doing constant N for Maxwell relation? Because that's how we derive it. There is nothing fundamental about it. That's, that's how it's done. At constant N, we will have DG is equal to minus SDT plus VDP. So what should be the Maxwell relation here? Partial of minus S with respect to partial of P, right? At constant temperature is equal to partial of what? Volume with partial temperature at constant P, right? So this is equation number eight. And we can write down two more equations just like we did for the other ones, right? What would they be? Partial G by partial T at constant pressure should be equal to how much? Minus S. Partial G by partial P at constant temperature should be how much? V. Equation nine is one of my favorite equations. It's really very interesting and it plays an extremely important role in the construction of phase diagrams, which we are going to be spending a lot of time once we get through with this algebra. This tells us, first of all, Gibbs free energy has kind of a more important role than the other free energies in a lot of chemistry problems, right? Because a lot of things happen at constant pressure and temperature, right? Unless you have a tight furnace or something, constant pressure is more natural. Something is going on constant pressure and temperature. This tells us that if you keep the pressure of a system constant, and change the temperature, the change in Gibbs energy is going to be minus S. Now we have done the postulates and there is a postulate in Kallen that we did not talk about, which says that the entropy must be zero, uh, positive, right? It cannot become zero. At, at absolute zero, the entropy goes to zero. This is a postulate that we have not used except for this particular one, we use it, that the entropy must always be positive. If the entropy is always positive, what does it tell us about Gibbs free energy with change with temperature, it must always go down, right? Furthermore, we know that the entropy of a solid is generally smaller than the entropy of a liquid. So it also tells us how quickly with the Gibbs free energy of a solid move versus how Gibbs quickly the free energy of a liquid move, it tells us the rates of few things. And we will be visiting this equation in great detail. This is what will allow us to construct phase diagrams. So it's a super important equation which just comes from one line of algebra. So we have done so far energy, enthalpy, Gibbs free energy. Which one remains? Helmholtz. What is the definition of Helmholtz free energy? E minus TS. So dA is equal to, again, dE minus TDS minus SDT dE is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu dN. And here we have minus TDS minus SDT. So TDS, TDS cancels out. What are we left with? dA is equal to minus PDV minus SDT plus mu dN. So what are the natural variables for A? They are N, V, and T, as we had suspected, right, in the fundamental relation. So this is a FR, or a fundamental relation. And this tells us that the natural variables for A are N, V, and T. For Maxwell relation, for MR, we would do constant N, which gives us dA So when I go around to conferences and someone asks me, 
oh, so you teach PhD thermodynamics. What do you teach there? And I go like, well, I teach Maxwell relations and things like that. They're like, oh, that's like undergrad. And if I'm in a bad mood, which it's not common, but every once in a while, the person who is asking me the question, I ask them something about fundamental relations, but they have no clue. So whatever you're doing here, I hope you have seen it in PCAN, but the point of this course is at the end of the course, I, I hope that with confidence you'll be like, I understand it better. I'm more confident in it and I see where it comes from. Not just PCAN, like in India, we see this stuff in high school in like 11th grade and I had no clue what is enthalpy and what is not. It was very complicated, right? So now you can see where it all comes from. It all follows from the postulate and it's really all about what are your control variables in an experiment? What is the condition for spontaneity? for given experimental control variables. That's where it comes from. So DA is equal to minus PDB minus SDT. Shah, tell me my Maxwell relations for this one. So partial A, partial A. Partial what? Partial A. No. Partial Maxwell relation. Oh, uh, partial P, partial P at constant B. No, you did not take the minus on the left side. So now you can't take it on the right side. Does everyone agree? Okay. So this is Maxwell relation number four. And the equation that Shah really wanted to tell us was partial A by partial V at constant T is equal to minus P and partial A by partial T at constant V is equal to minus S. Okay, so we derived a whole bunch of equations today and I'm going to summarize them in one page. I'll oh. wait for just a moment. Yeah, go ahead. Huh? Okay. Don't get spoiled. I was supposed to go to China end of this month and I would have bought some Chinese chocolate, but I have traveled enough. I said I'm not coming. So, okay, so let's, and any questions about this before I summarize what we have done today? That would be useful to just look at everything together. No questions? Okay. So today we have looked at four state functions, right? So recap of today. This is a long recap, so don't start packing up your bags. Recap of today. We looked at four state functions, E, H, G and A, right? For each of the state functions, we had a fundamental relation. So four fundamental relations. For each of the state functions, we had a Maxwell relation. So four Maxwell relations. And for each of the state function, we had two further relations, which was just the first derivative, right? So eight more relations. So we have a bunch of relations. Let's try to capture all of them. So let's start with E. So first thing we have four, fundamental relations. And after we do this, we will come back to N because we ignored N, but then we'll come back to N and see what this tells us about chemical potential, all of this. So four fundamental relations. The first one was DE is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu DN, right? In other words, the natural variables for E are S, V, N. The second one, was dg is equal to vdp minus sdt plus mu dn. In other words, natural variables for g are p, t, and n. The third one was dh is equal to tds plus vdp plus mu dn. And this means natural variable for h are s, p, and n. And fourth one is DA is equal to minus PDV minus SDT plus mu DN or natural variable for A or VTN. I do not remember two, three, and four. I will never remember them. I remember first though, right? If you remember first, and if you remember the expressions for H, that H is equal to E plus PV, G is equal to H minus TS, and A is equal to E minus TS, Deriving everything else is very easy. It takes a couple of lines, but you can do it, okay? I don't recommend doing that, however. Don't come up to the final exam thinking you will derive all of this. It's easy, but it's like two mathematicians arguing with each other. One mathematician wrote a formula. The other mathematician goes, I don't understand it. 
And then they quarrel for like two hours, they fight. And they fill up five pages or five blackboards. And then the other mathematician goes, oh yes, it is trivial. So for a mathematician, trivial means you can deny it, right? So it is trivial, but it takes some time. So it's good to have these equations written on one page because you can derive them, but it takes time. Then we had four Maxwell's relations. And I'm not, I will not be writing them in the order corresponding to which fundamental equation I have. It doesn't really matter. So we had partial V by partial T at constant P is equal to minus partial S by partial P at constant T. We had partial T by partial V at constant S is equal to minus partial P by partial S at constant V. We had partial T by partial P at constant S is equal to partial V by partial S at constant P. And finally, we had partial B, partial P by partial T at constant V is equal to partial S by partial V at constant T. So again, it's, it's like, I'm warning you again and again, it's like one of those commercials where it's like, do not try it at home. Don't try to remember it. There's no point, it's pointless. But the proof should be obvious in your head. How did we get to the Maxwell relations? We wrote down fundamental relations and we applied Euler's condition for total derivative theory. That's it, that's what you need to remember. And these eight equations are extremely useful. They show up again and again and again. And while they are useful, they are also going to make your life painful in the remaining semester, right? I can make so many homework problems now that you will suffer and I will get Slack messages at 3 a.m. Like, oh. So something we ignored, uh, any questions about this? Okay. So for deriving Maxwell relation, we ignored N, right? And by the virtue of ignoring N, we ignored chemical potential. But now let's get back to chemical potential. Let's look at the fundamental relation and try to define the chemical potential for each of the four fundamental relations because each of them has chemical potential showing up in that, right? So we can derive, define chemical potential in four different ways. So four different, and this is the part that is definitely not clear at an undergrad level. At least it wasn't for me. Four different ways to define chemical potential. So if I look at the first fundamental relation, DE is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu DN. How would I define mu from E? Elizabeth, what do you think? If I look at this equation, and from a math perspective, how does mu connect to partial derivative of E? Just tell me if what I wrote is correct or not. Partial E by partial N at constant S comma V. Would you agree with that, Elizabeth? Yeah. Because it's a function of three derivatives, right? And DE is equal to mu DN if you hold DS and DV at zero, right? That's the meaning of partial. So mu can be defined from E by differentiating it with respect to N at constant S and V. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Oh, so I think you're going to say that you can define and from Gibbs, Helmholtz, yeah. and okay. So That's what I'm saying. So you tell me the next one. Oh tell me mu from G. Uh, EG over D N at constant pressure and temperature. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which one do you want? So then I can also define it from H. What would that be? Now, well, it's still chocolate. Who wants a chocolate? Go for it. Okay, Ben. S and P. And tell me the fourth one also, Ben. Constant V and D. So if you ignored the partial derivatives, in other words, 
if you did not know what are natural variables, you would just write down mu is partial e by partial n. Mu is partial g by partial n. Mu is partial a by partial n. Mu is partial h by partial n. But it's not, right? You really need to know the natural variables, right? If you think about the things that are showing up in the downstairs for all of these three equations, they are the natural variables for the thing on the top, right? So chemical potential can be defined in four different ways. They are all the same. It does not matter which one you use. It's the same chemical potential. They are all the same. It's, and, and we will be revisiting this in a lecture or two when we talk about something known as partial molar quantity, which is generally defined only at constant pressure and temperature. So for that reason, chemical potential has a very special relation with the Gibbs free energy. We will see that next time or the one after that. With the others, you can still define it in terms of that the relation is not so special. Any questions about this? G tends to be the most useful for sure. The if you if this is the one that tends up ends up being most useful, and you will see why. So yeah, go ahead, Anjali. You could do it same thing for anything, but this, the reason why this one is special because of pressure and temperature, because a lot of the phase diagrams and stuff we do are constant pressure and temperature. That's why it ends up being special. So I want, the last thing I want to do today is to show you one application of Maxwell's relation because we derived all this stuff. Let's see how it can actually be useful. So this is one of those problems which could be easily a homework or a midterm problem or a final problem and we will work through it. And then we will stop because we covered a lot of ground today. Application of Maxwell relation. So we have Murray to remind us that the ideal gas law looks like PV is equal to NRT. Right, Murray? Yeah. Great. And when we were talking about heat capacities, we introduced a term which we called pi t or the internal pressure of a gas, right? We did not do much with it, but we introduced it. It mattered for the heat capacity, remember? We showed that heat capacity for an ideal gas is du by dt. We didn't have to use partial derivatives. We could get away with total derivatives. And the reason why we could do that is because pi t, which is defined as partial e by partial b at constant t comma n is equal to zero for ideal gas. Anyone remembers why? This is definitely a chocolate question. What? Internal energy depends only on temperature for ideal gas, right? E is equal to three by two nRT. So because E is equal to three by two nRT. So if you differentiate it with respect to volume, you get nothing. So this is an ideal gas law. What is the, that is, and, and again, it's a good point to remind you all that this is an example of equation of state, which is to be dif distinguished from a fundamental equation, right? If you, how many equations of state did you need to know in order to get a fundamental equation? Three. Why three? Because there are three natural variables for everything, right? So every equation of state corresponds to knowing a relation for one of the partials, one of the stuff that comes up. If you know only two equations of state, the third term will be missing, right? And you have to differentiate. Now you have to integrate and get something right. So, so what is an ideal? So that's, this is an equation of state for an ideal gas. The next complicated equation of state, which we use in chemistry quite a lot, is the Van der Waals equation of state, right? Ideal gas law says that gas particles are point-like and they are moving elastically, right? They, uh, they whenever they, they rarely collide, when they do, it's elastic, they just go back. And, uh, and there is no force apart from that. Van der Waals gas says that the, anytime I have to derive Van der Waals gas, I start by doing this. I say, well, we have a finite volume. So V minus NB, not just V, is equal to nrt and this is not the full story we have to go from here to p is equal to nrt by v minus nb and then we say that there is an attractive force also which reduces the pressure and that is minus a n square by v square right so this is quote unquote derivation of van der waals because i never remember this formula so my question for you is 
what is the internal pressure for a VDW gas for a Van der Waals gas? How do we do that? How do we calculate it? If anyone can finish this proof for me right now, you get three chocolates. The proof should be full, correct? Are you brave enough to do that? I don't have all written down, but I have the idea. Go ahead. Uh, we have to input that equation into E equals three over two NRT. So input have, which equation where? We have to convert Van der Waals equations to NRT equals, I suppose it would be. It won't work. That way you will get stuck. I've tried it and I failed. Okay. You can try it if it works. Any other ideas? It's a natural way to think that I should go that way, but you will get stuck sooner or later. No, you should try it. Don't, that's really brave that you try it. It's awesome. Please, who else wants to try? I need partial of E with respect to partial of V. That's your hint. Partial of E reminds you of change in E. Change in E reminds you of DE. What is the fundamental relation for DE? Go ahead. DBS minus PD is the same. Then? With constant pain and rigid. Okay, you are very confident. So now you have to tell me the full steps. And then we put Maxwell Rayson. TDS minus PDV plus mu DN. Okay, then what do we do? Then we put del E, del V. Del E by del V at constant T N is equal to? Delhi, Delhi. So it is T. Huh? It's P, Delhi, Delhi. It's T. Uh -huh. P equals to zero. Uh, so it's minus P, sorry. Minus P. Slow down, slow down. So it's going to be DS by DV, right? Minus P, right? Because we have divided by DV. And what is the third term? What happens to mu dn at constant n? n equals to zero. So that's zero, right? Now we have to use a Maxwell relation. Del is del at constant. Yeah, so del, and we will use this one. Del, 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 is, del v at constant t is equal to partial p by partial t at constant v. Why do we want to use this one? Because we have partial, we have the equation for p given to us, right? So this becomes, yeah, you get three chocolates. I would not remember this too, so I'm impressed. Thank you. So T, and, and we have to be careful. So this is not partial S by partial V. This is, this is not DS by DV. This is partial S by partial V at constant T comma N, right? And one of the Maxwell relations, and again, this is something you're like, I don't know how to do this. So you have to stare at the Maxwell relation and see which one might simplify your life. Right, so partial s by partial v at constant t comma n is equal to partial p by partial t at constant v. So this is partial p by partial t at constant v comma n minus v minus p using mr. Now we can go to the Van der Waals equation of state and think about partial p by partial t. The Van der Waals equation of state has two parts. The second part, a n square by v square, does it depend on temperature? No. So when you differentiate with respect to t, what do you get? A big zero, right? Nothing. When you differentiate the first part with respect to T, what do you get? NR by V minus NB, right? So this will be T multiplied by NR by V minus NB minus pressure. What is that? That is simply plus AN square by V square. Because that's what we have over here, right? The term that we just got here, nRT by V minus NB is the term that shows over here. And if you subtract P from it, what does it mean? It's the same as taking AN square by V square on the left side, right? So you're left with plus AN square by V square. So you suddenly see that the second term in Van der Waals equation is the internal pressure of the gas, okay? So what I did right now should be a bit complex to all of you except Subhrabi, but that's why he got three chocolates. 
So hopefully it becomes less complex to you because it's a non-trivial operation. You have probably done something like this in undergrad PCAM. It's a bunch of algebras. It's hard to remember the exact steps. You have to carefully start with the fundamental relation for energy, use a Maxwell relations at this point, and then use the equation of state, right? So we use three important concepts to come up with this. And the way Stephen was suggesting, it might have worked. So I want you to go and try it, Stephen, okay? Yeah, try it at home. If it works, then I will hand deliver you chocolates, okay? Any questions about this? Okay, good. So we will stop here for today. Next class, which is uh, now all, all classes will be in person. I, I don't have Zoom classes. Next class, what we are going to do is to think about partial molar quantities and this thing that I said about chemical potential, we will revisit that. And now we are getting to the applied part of thermo. We are going to start to think about phase diagrams and phase transitions and things like that. I will do a little bit of that and then I will come back to the general transforms, okay? Because I want to show you some applied useful stuff before we go into more math, right? So today we already showed that the natural variables are what they are. Logical transforms gives you a more direct way of doing that. So, and the midterm will be released on uh, 19th in the morning. It's written on the class website. You will have one week, full week to do it. Everything that is done until 17th will be on the midterm. It will be more heavily weighted towards things that happen this week. So it will be released next Thursday morning and everything until next Tuesday will be on the midterm. I'm going to give a poll on Slack. So be ready for it. The, there will be two questions. I want to thank you. I want you to think about the poll. Option one will be fewer questions, but harder. Option two will be lots of questions, but slightly easier, emphasizing slightly. So think about it. When I give the poll, I will look at the uh, opinions that you all have. Okay, you can have a discussion within yourselves. Okay, see you next time.